Um, so today we're going to talk about management of specifically tube electropic pregnancy. Um, I'm Caroline Prentice, one of the ST7s. So what I'm hoping to cover today are the options for management of an ectopic pregnancy. So um, we're going to cover emergency management, then conservative or sometimes called expectant management, medical management and surgical management. We're going to talk a bit about patient selection criteria. Um, so who is suitable for, for which option? Um, unless otherwise stated, these are as per the current NICE guidelines for 2019, um, which we've adopted at our trust. We'll do a little bit about the surgical techniques that are available and then talk a bit about follow up and future prognosis as well. So some of the terms that I'm going to use, EPU refers to the early pregnancy unit, so a specialist unit with access to scanning and bloods um, specialist opinion. An IUP refers to an intrauterine pregnancy, so a pregnancy correctly sighted within the womb. PUL is pregnancy of unknown location, so you can't see it on scan, but you know they're pregnant. And then ectopic pregnancy, so pregnancy outside of the endometrial cavity. Beta HCG referring to beta human chorionic gonadotropin, so the um, hormone that's released by pregnancy tissue. MTX is a, an abbreviation for methotrexate, so it's just a bit quicker to type and um, easier to use. And then UPT is a urine pregnancy test, a test which measures beta-HCG. So uh, this is a little recap, um, but ectopic pregnancy is common. So it's about 1% of all pregnancies. It'll feel like more than that in the hospital setting because we're um, seeing, you know, we're selecting for these uh, patients that have had uh, complications and risks. 90% of them will be tubal ectopic pregnancies, but the other sites are caesarean scar, interstitial, corneal, um, rudimentary horn, and then ovarian, intramural, cervical, and abdominal. A live ectopic is where you've got a sac containing a fetus, and that fetus has a heartbeat, um, and this has occurred outside of the womb. This is a high-risk pregnancy, because it suggests that everything is very rapidly growing. A ruptured ectopic pregnancy is where whichever structure, commonly the tube, that was containing the pregnancy is burst open, and that's very dangerous. It can cause life-threatening bleeding. And a heterotopic pregnancy is where you have both a viable intrauterine pregnancy and an ectopic pregnancy, so a pregnancy outside of the womb. And they require slightly different management because of the, the dual nature of the diagnosis. So I want to first talk about emergency management. So this is not the most common, um, but it's the most important. So everything else that we talk about today, we can only offer those choices if this is not an emergency. So emergency management, if you've got someone who is collapsed, if he is fainting or if they feel dizzy when they're standing up, um, it would suggest that they've already lost a significant volume of blood and therefore are not suitable for anything other um, than surgical management. Certainly if they've got hemodynamic compromise, so they've, they've got a tachycardia, their blood pressure is low or they've got a raised respiratory rate. If they have severe pain, so severe lower abdominal pain, that can be vaginal pain, rectal pain, pain up into the shoulders and into the neck. And that's all evidence of um, intra-abdominal bleeding. So these women are a clinical emergency. We want to get um, senior help straight away. We want to make sure that we can um, have access to and arrange theatres as soon as possible. We should get some good going IV access, take bloods for a cross match. We should be resuscitating these women with fluid and blood if they need it uh, before going to theatre. If they're severely compromised, it may be that we need to do a laparotomy and that's an open surgery. Um, but ideally, we would still hope to do a keyhole surgery, a laparoscopy for surgical management. And a word of warning, young fit women will compensate extremely well for large volumes of blood loss. So by the time a young woman is feeling dizzy or um, collapsing, she's probably lost nearly 30 to 40 percent of her circulating volume. So that's an, um, an extreme amount of blood to use, lose, but um, young people will compensate really well until they suddenly deteriorate. So we need to take these signs really seriously um, and act quickly. So now we're coming to the other end of the spectrum. So hopefully we won't see that many um, collapsed emergency ectopics. We're seeing people that have come through the early pregnancy clinic. They've had scans, they've had bloods. Uh, we've got time to consider our options and go through. So 
going from the, the least interventionist option, which is conservative management, we'll discuss this first. So a conservative or expectant management is just waiting for a pregnancy to resolve on its own uh, without any treatment whatsoever. And it sounds it, it can be a little bit difficult to get your head around. You think, well, they've got an ectopic pregnancy. I need to treat it. Um, but if you consider it to be a tubal miscarriage, it, it helps you to understand the process that's going on. So this is a failing pregnancy within the tube. The tissue's not growing um, and it will eventually break down and be reabsorbed by the body without the need for any um, either toxic medication or the need for surgery. There's about 30% of women, if they meet the criteria, um, will be able to have a successful conservative management and not need any other treatment at all. But that's of a specific selected group of people. And I'll go on to how we select those women. And if you flip that on its head, it means that actually 70% of women will require either medical or surgical management. Um, and that's usually because during the follow up period when it, it becomes apparent that they're not suitable to be managed any more conservatively. So what criteria are we looking for? Who is the ideal candidate to have conservative management? So clinically, they've got to be pain free. So you can't have someone that's in pain. That could be a sign of rupture or impending rupture. So they need to be pain free and they need to be clinically stable. So normal observations, they're not feeling unwell. The size of the ectopic pregnancy needs to be less than 35 millimetres. That's measured on ultrasound. It's important to notice that it's not the size of the um, sac, that is the entire size of the ectopic pregnancy. The heartbeat uh, needs to be absent. So if there is a yolk sac or a fetal pole, there needs to be no heartbeat. Um, we'll come on to a, a little bit more about that later, but I would argue that actually it's unlikely that you'll successfully conservatively manage someone if there's an embryo, even if that embryo doesn't have a heartbeat. The beta HCG value should be less than 1,500. And the patient needs to agree to have about six weeks worth of follow up. So we can't just sort of say that's it, it's probably all fine, off you go. These are women that are going to have to come back. They're going to have to come back at least weekly and sometimes more often than that. And they need to be aware of that from the start. So what process do we follow? They've met the criteria. They think it's a good idea. We think it's a good idea. We're going to give them the option in the leaflets. So we should, even at this start of the process, be giving them the information about medical and surgical management. So we've already suggested that there'll be 70% of women that will um, have to go on to have medical or surgical management. So we should give them that information at an earlier stage. As I've said, the follow-up can be prolonged up to six or seven weeks, and we need to let them know. The most vital thing is this safety net advice. So if they develop pain, um, they would need surgical management. So as they're away at home and coming in for their bloods, they need to know to call us if anything changes. So how do we monitor them? How do we make sure that this conservative approach is working? And we're going to do some bloods. So we'll do our day one is the day that we diagnose it or day zero if you prefer. So we should be checking in the first week, they should have their bloods on day two, day four, day seven. And what we're looking for is a sustained fall in the beta HCG. Now it doesn't need to be huge, um, it doesn't need to be halving or anything like that, but we're looking for at least a 15% fall when you compare day four to day two and day seven to day four. If you're getting that pattern and everything is falling and they're remaining well, then we can repeat these weekly until you get a, a blood value of less than 20. And at that point, we would discharge them um, and say that they've had a successful conservative management. If you're not getting that pattern, if the, either the um, hormone level is static, um, so it's not really changing or it's rising, then we should rescan them and consider the alternatives. And it may be that actually um, they can be considered for medical management or it may be that actually things are just growing rapidly and we need to offer them surgical management. So that's the, the process that we would follow. So moving on, our next sort of least invasive option would be to offer medical management. So medical management is giving a drug called methotrexate and that's to stop an ectopic pregnancy continuing. So you might have heard of methotrexate, it's used for lots of different indications. It's an anti-cancer drug, it can be used in arthritis um, and it's a folic acid antagonist. So it um, targets rapidly dividing cells that use folic acid and then pregnancy 
tissue is rapidly dividing, so it responds particularly well to methotrexate, and that's how it works. Usually, it's given as a single dose, a single intramuscular dose um, of 50 milligrams per meter squared body surface area. Um, it's generally, with the right patients, it's quite successful, so there's a 90% success rate, and then 10% of women will either need a second dose or they'll need to go on to have surgery. And it's important to be aware that there is a 7% risk of rupture, um, and that can happen at any point in their treatment. So it's not immediately, it can happen literally as, as long as they've got a, a positive level of beta HCG. And there are rare cases that have ruptured actually after the beta HCG is negative. We would advise people to avoid further pregnancy for three months afterwards. The reason is that it can it's quite a long time, quite a long half-life, so it takes a while for the um, drug to get out of the system. And where it's an antifolate, if you were to have a, a pregnancy in that time, it may be that there's a higher risk of neural tube defects um, due to a lack of folate and folic acid. It's important to let people know that it's not licensed as well, so it's unlicensed for this indication. It has been widely used for decades. There's many studies about its safety and efficacy, and indeed it's recommended by um, NICE in their guideline, but we should be letting people know. And the way I tend to word it, because it does sound a little bit confusing, is that it, it won't make the drug company any money to pay and go through all of the um, the trials of getting a license for the product, it wouldn't make them any more money. So it's it's essentially unlicensed because of financial reasons, um, but we're confident with all of the safety data behind it. And generally, once people have, have grasped that con uh, concept, they're usually happier to go ahead. So it's also worth pointing out that most drugs are unlicensed in children and in pregnancy as well. So um, the criteria for medical management, similar to conservative, um, but you can use it with a beta HCG of up to 5,000. So again, we're looking for women that are um, pain-free, that are clinically stable, have a ectopic mass that is less than 35 millimetres in size. There should be no heartbeat present in that embryo if there is one. The beta HCG should be less than 5,000, as we've mentioned. And again, it's this lengthy follow-up. So they need to agree and be able to come for about six weeks worth of follow-up. The people that we should be excluding that shouldn't be offering medical management to is if the diagnosis is not clear. So if they're actually a PUL and we're not 100% sure, but we think it's probably an ectopic, we haven't ruled out an intrauterine pregnancy. It may be that a diagnostic lap, a surgical option is... Um, more sensible because you can do a diagnostic lap and rule out a tubal ectopic that way without interfering with a possible viable early intrauterine pregnancy. So where the diagnosis isn't clear, we shouldn't be using um, methotrexate without explicitly warning the patient that it would damage a viable IUP. People with liver and kidney dysfunction aren't able to have methotrexate. Similarly, if they've got ongoing infections, so things like PID or active TB, um, these women should not be offered methotrexate. If they're already immunocompromised for some reason or on long term steroid use, um, again, they shouldn't be using methotrexate. And I'd be really careful in using it in women that are unlikely to attend follow up regularly. So we've had a few women recently where we've avoided surgery, given methotrexate and then really struggled because they haven't come for their bloods on time, they haven't attended follow-up as they were expected to, and you're left with someone in a high-risk situation, you don't really know how they're, um, how they're getting on with the medical management. So what process do we follow? Again, we should be talking about all the options, giving them all the leaflets so they're aware of all the alternatives. We should be taking written consent for medical management because it's a medical procedure. We should be giving advice about the um, follow up, warning people that it can take a long time. And again, that really, really vital safety netting information. So if you develop pain, uh, if you feel unwell, any signs of an ectopic pregnancy, it's important that they either call or go to ED straight away. So again, very, very similar to the conservative management. Um, it's just that we've given them a drug this time. So you're looking at bloods on day naught, day four, day seven, and you're looking for a 15% fall. We would accept a little rise in the middle, so a small sort of hump just a couple of days after we give the methotrexate can, can happen. They can get a little bit of pain um, at that time and that's that's a normal part of treatment. 
So it's not unusual as the methotrexate works for them to have that little slight increase in beta HCG before it dips down. But between day naught and seven, that's when we're looking for that 15% fall. If it's falling, keep going. We'll repeat it weekly until it's less than 20. Um, if it's static or even if it rises between day four and seven, if it um, doesn't look like it's working, then we can consider giving a second dose or you could um, consider actually just offering surgery at that point. So when you're counselling women, you want to give them you know, an individualised idea of success. So it sounds really good when you say there's 90% chance of success. But there are some features that would make me really more strongly offer it or less strongly offer it, if that makes sense. So a successful candidate uh, for uh, medical management, if they just had a sort of one of these heterogeneous mass, so already it looks like the pregnancy is breaking down, there's evidence of blood clot and disorganised tissue, they are more likely to be successful compared to somebody who's got a gestation sac, a yolk sac, and certainly with an embryo. If they're starting off with a lower beta HCG, so you know low thousands, for example, they're again much more likely to have a successful outcome than somebody who's nearer the 5,000 uh, limit, the top end. If this is somebody who's got either a static or very slowly rising beta HCG, again, this is less active pregnancy tissue and they are more likely to have successful treatment compared to somebody who's rapidly rising or even nearly doubling with an ectopic. And looking at that initial fall after the methotrexate, so if you've got a big fall, if it goes from, say, you know, 1,500 all the way down to 700 after your dose, that's a really decent fall of 50%. It's more likely that they're going to have successful management. Whereas if you're tracking these sort of small increments down, um, I'd be a little bit more worried that this is not going to be um, the only treatment that they require. And certainly, although you can have that increase in beta HCG from day one to four as the um, pregnancy is affected, it is another marker of somebody that may be more prone to a treatment failure. And that's not to say that you shouldn't offer it or that you should just bail out and, and perform surgery. But it's just to be aware that these are the women you might want to keep a slightly closer eye on um, and just warn them. So moving on to our third and final option, we've got surgical management. So these are the criteria. Surgery is really the first line indicated option if they have pain, if they are unstable in any way, and if they have signs of hemoperitoneum or rupture. So this is these are the emergencies we were talking about before that require immediate um, access to theatre. If you've got a large ectopic, so more than 35 millimetres, um, they are not suitable for medical management or for conservative management. Certainly, if you've got a live ectopic, uh, ectopic pregnancy with a heartbeat, these are going to require surgical management. And if the beta HCG is greater than 5,000, once again, we need to offer surgery. And I would add to this group people that will not attend follow up. So if you've got somebody who is um, chaotic or unreliable or you're worried they will not um, carefully attend follow up, we should be considering offering them surgery as a first line because then it's treated and they're, they're done basically from that first admission. It's also really important to consider patient choice. Um, so we're offering a choice of conservative medical or surgical. There may be women that are completely suitable for conservative management, but actually they don't want to keep coming back to the hospital, thank you very much, for uh, six weeks. They would rather just have the surgery and be done with it. There may be women that um, really have decided they don't want to expose themselves to methotrexate, they're worried about the side effects again, or they're worried about it failing, and would rather just opt for surgical management straight away. And as long as they're you know, they've been given the options, they've been given time to think about everything. Um, we would support their decision for, for surgical management. So the process that we go through, um, ideally, we would be doing a keyhole surgery, laparoscopy surgery over laparotomy. Doing a laparotomy is, um, has a longer recovery. Um, it has a um, impact on adhesions in the future, so it has more of an impact on their future fertility compared to doing a keyhole surgery. And sometimes if somebody is unstable, we're not able to insufflate the abdomen, then we would have to go for a laparotomy, but it should not be our first option. So there's two different types of tubal surgery. So one is a salpingectomy, which is where we remove the entire affected tube. So the whole of the tube comes out with the ectopic pregnancy within it. 
And then a salpingotony is where the tube is very carefully opened up um, along its length. The ectopic pregnancy is removed and then the tube is washed out. Um, we don't tend to routinely do this option uh, because future pregnancy rates appear to be fairly similar with both techniques. And it may be that it's because you're leaving behind a, a damaged tube by doing a salpingotomy. So although you save the tube, it may not be functionally normal. Um, however, if the um, other side, so you say you've got a left sided ectopic, if the right side tube is clearly abnormal, if it has, if it's filled with fluid, if it's got adhesions, or indeed if it had already been removed from a previous ectopic, then we should be doing our best to give them the option of spontaneous conception in the future. So we should be doing our best to uh, do a salpingotomy. But if we're leaving behind one healthy looking tube, then um, that would be a reasonable option um, if everything else looked healthy. So when we do the consent forms, we would say to them, um, these are the options, we will make the decision um, whilst we're looking. And I tend to phrase it that we're not asking them to make a choice between having the tube removed or having the tube repaired, but we will try to consider the best option for them at the time to um, preserve the most fertility that we can. And that's generally uh, what we aim to do. The reason we don't routinely offer salpingotomy, you could argue that actually if the rates are similar with both techniques, we should be doing the least restrictive option, which would be leaving the tube behind. But it's, it's quite technically challenging surgery. The tubes are really small. Um, it's quite fiddly. You've got to open it out and uh, take out the pregnancy. You can then either suture the tube closed or leave it open to heal. But it does have a higher risk. It's more difficult, so it has a, a longer procedure time and a higher risk of complications. And we do risk not getting all of the pregnancy tissue out and leaving residual tissue. And that patient may then need further surgery or may need a, um, a dose of methotrexate. So that's the, the rationale for tending to remove the affected tube rather than um, try and just remove the ectopic pregnancy. So here, um, this is a, a ruptured tube ectopic, so you can see really obvious. This is the left tube. You can see the pregnancy tissue bursting out of the top. So uh, once it's been removed, you can see we've just taken that whole tube away, left behind the ovary. There's no need to take away the ovary. You can separate it carefully from the tube. Um, so you can see here, this is the, the end, the fimbrial end of the tube where it's attached to the ovary. Um, and here we've just taken it all away. So they're left behind with a healthy ovary here, healthy ovary here, one healthy looking tube and the abnormal tube that's been removed. So then the thing that the patients always ask you um, that's really difficult to deal with is they say, um, well, what do you think I should do? You know, where patients aren't always used to be given a lot of choice. So you, you've said to them that you're suitable for this type of management or that type of management, but what do you think I should do? So helping patients navigate these complex choices is, is a real skill. Um, it's not something I would expect um, and someone who is not either um, very experienced or very interested in early pregnancy to do. So if you were at an SHO or junior registrar or even senior registrar level, it's worth you know running this past another person um, and involving always involving a consultant in the decision making. So the first thing to consider is the suitability criteria. So there's no point in offering somebody conservative management if it's not going to work, if they're not suitable, if it's not a good option for them. So first, before you talk to them, think about, well, what can I actually do? What, what is suitable for me to offer them? Think about their home circumstances. So what support do they have? If you're going to offer conservative or medical management, who have they got to support them at home? Is there someone that could call for help if they collapsed? Is there someone that could bring them to hospital? Have they got the emotional support to go through a prolonged follow up? Where do they live? Do they live absolutely miles away, you know, in the rural countryside with little access to support? Have they got transport in? Do they have children? Is it going to be really difficult? Have they got hundreds of, you know, pick up times and nursery times and childcare? Can they actually manage the, the follow up that we're offering around their, their commitments? It's always worth um, having a chat to women and they may often they often bring it up themselves. But, you know, what are your future fertility plans is quite an open way of asking it. It's less emotive than do you want children, which sort of implies that they definitely should want children. Um, but what are your future fertility plans or is fertility on the agenda for you at the moment? These are more open questions that allow people to go, no, I'm not 
you know, not interested in fertility at the moment. So we need to know, have they had tubal disease in the past? Have they, they know they've got PID, do they know they've got blocked tubes? Um, have they had an ectopic pregnancy in the past? Was this IVF treatment? Are they already undergoing fertility treatment? Or did this just happen out of the blue? They weren't even trying and this is just uh, something that's happened to them. It's also a really personal choice. So some people may be terrified and think actually the option of surgery just is completely terrifying. I really don't want surgery. Um, and so they're much more keen to consider a medical option, even if they're at the sort of more of the failure end of that sort of success bar that I showed you. Some people just want it over. They just want closure. They don't want to have to keep thinking about it and want to keep coming back and actually they're upset and they would just quite like this to be over. And if you offer them uh, surgical management, it will be over within the next day or two uh, from a medical point of view. It's worth asking what are their past experiences? Have they had an ectopic before? Asking, you know, they may have other people they know that had um, really successful medical management or they may think that surgery is their only option. So what are their ideas and their expectations of management? And it's always worth noting that women that are clinically stable have got time to consider, they've got time to discuss it with their loved ones and they've got time to choose the management that they want. So I would hope that no one has ever um, felt that they've been put under pressure to make a decision. And this is of course clinically stable women, so if the only option is surgery according to our selection criteria then we need to be mindful of that. But women that have their options open, it, it's perfectly acceptable to say, look, have a think about it. Here's the information. Let us know, ideally sooner rather than later. But if you've given them that safety net um, information, give them time to get their heads around it and to decide the right option for you. So they're not just making a, a snap reflex decision. So things that I sort of go through and considerations to make when you're counselling someone about how to manage an ectopic pregnancy. Um, if they've got no previous history of subfertility, if they've had a, you know, a reasonably quick conception, this was not expected, there's no real difference in the outcomes. So I would say I would place a higher importance on what their preferences and what their thoughts and what their feelings are and I would say that there's no real difference in the outcomes um, if you're otherwise well. If they do have a history of subfertility, um, so if they know they have tubal damage, if they know that um, that there is something there in the background, they took a long time to conceive, they're having problems anyway, conservative or medical management is actually associated with improved outcomes for future pregnancy. So surgery is not the preferred option if they're already struggling, if they've already got um, risk factors and problems. If they've had a previous salpingectomy already, so they've already had one tube removed, you need to think really carefully about surgery for these women because actually if you go in and you're not able to do a salpingectomy and you remove that tube, they then have no option for um, a spontaneous conception. Their only chance of pregnancy in the future would be IVF. And for some women, they they may have come to terms with that. They may already be looking at IVF and actually they you know don't mind having their tubes removed. But um, we need to think very carefully and you should ideally be seeking advice from somebody um, within the fertility department as well. Some people just want that definitive. They don't want to come to follow up, but they just want it over and done with. And surgery is a, generally a definitive option. Um, so you come in, you have your surgery, it's finished, you don't need to follow up. It does, however, have a, a complication rate and it's about two in a thousand, the risk of serious complications. Um, but for some women that will be higher. So if they've got a raised BMI, if they've had lots of previous abdominal surgery, so, you know, multiple cesareans or other abdominal procedures, the risks are potentially higher for those women. And you may want to um, more strongly advise conservative or medical management. So these are some of the things that you need to would need to go through with a patient in order to, to help them make their decision. So what's the prognosis? We've said it's broadly similar um, with either of the outcomes or either of the treatments, but the successful future pregnancy rate is about 90%. If this is just a chance ectopic, we don't know why it's happened. There's no other subfertility factors. They don't have PID, they don't smoke. Um, actually the chance of a successful future pregnancy is about 90% um, so that's quite reasonable. 
if you know they've got other problems, and a lot of women with an ectopic pregnancy will, so if you know that they've got pelvic inflammatory disease, if they've got fluid in the tube, hydrosalpinx, if they've previously had an ectopic or if they've had previous abdominal surgery, the chance is a lot lower, so it's about 60%. There's not really a lot that we can do about it, but it's important to let women know. Um, so it may be that they want to consider looking at their options in terms of, of IVF or assisted conception. The recurrence rates are quite variable, so it depends which paper you look at, and they've all got slightly different um, patient cohorts and patient groups, but the recurrence rates are anywhere between 10 and about 18 and a half percent. Now, if you've removed a, a damaged tube, you would think that it, they're not going to get another ectopic, but generally if you've got an ectopic, it's a sign that you may have a risk factor such as tubal damage, which could be present on both sides. So even with surgery to remove a tube, there is still a recurrence rate. The recurrence rate is potentially slightly higher um, if you've had a salpingotomy where you've had tubal surgery or if you had medical management and left the tube behind. But it's, it's really quite patchy and quite variable depending on which paper you look at. The most important thing is offering an early scan in any subsequent pregnancy um, and we should be doing that around six weeks or earlier if they have symptoms. The reason that's so important is not just because we need to know because they need treatment, but the earlier that we find a treatment we may be able to offer them more conservative or medical management rather than run the risk of them having a, you know, a ruptured ectopic and having their other tube removed. So it's really important that we let people know that there is a recurrence rate and could they um, please let us know and we accept direct referrals for anybody that's had a previous ectopic pregnancy so they don't need to go through their GP. Psychological well-being is something that we often forget about with ectopic pregnancy but it's a pregnancy loss um, we should consider it in the same way that we do with any pregnancy loss and there's quite a lot of good support on the ectopic trust website which I've put here. Um, and things like the Willows group, there are support groups and some people may even require um, counselling and, and loss and bereavement counselling. So it can be quite scary. You can end up dealing with the fact that you've had a medical emergency, especially if you've come in unwell as an emergency, had emergency surgery, been through a life threatening experience and lost your pregnancy all at the same time. Um, so the the peak incidence of people struggling is often um, a little bit delayed, so it tends to be sort of four and six weeks down the line. So it's really important that um, people's psychological well-being is considered as well. So I'm just going to cover a little bit about non-tubal ectopic pregnancies. So they are um, they're less common. They account for probably some about five percent of ectopic pregnancies, depending on again which papers you look at. The technique of how you management is really, really different. So um, it depends on the site and it depends on the presentation as well. Quite often, these are ones that we would seek a tertiary referral to a specialist centre, to somewhere like um, King's or Imperial, um, just to get a, a second opinion about how we're going to manage them. There's a very good Royal College guideline if you wanted to look a little bit more. Um, but some of the specific techniques for these situations, so you can get a, an ectopic pregnancy in a caesarean scar. So one of the quite um, well publicised options is to, under ultrasound guidance, do a suction evacuation, similar as you would do for a, um, a miscarriage in the first trimester, but placing a stitch around the cervix so that you can then tie off that cervix once you've completed the suction evacuation to try and tamponade any blood loss. Um, you can also use a uterine balloon, so something like even just a Foley catheter inflated to about 20 mils, 30 mils. And again, you're trying to just tamponade it, so put pressure to reduce the blood loss, and then you can remove that suture and that balloon um, after a couple of days once the, the main risk of bleeding has finished. So an interstitial pregnancy, and this is one in the portion of the tube that's joining the uterus, these can be surgically excised depending on the location, and that would either be done um, laparoscopically, so keyhole surgery from the outside, or even hysteroscopically, so with a, a camera through the cervix into the womb and then resected from the inside. There are um, options for direct injection with methotrexate, but for all of these you're looking at quite small case numbers, so there's no real um, agreed guideline, it's more on a case-by-case -case basis. So a corneal pregnancy is when you've got a rudimentary horn, so a completely separate rudimentary horn away from the main uterine cavity. And these require removal as 
there'll be a lot else you can do with them. So that can either be open or laparoscopic removal of that rudimentary horn with the pregnancy within it. And then a um, cervical pregnancy, so a pregnancy within the cervix, you wouldn't want to manage these surgically, um, ideally, because there's such a high risk of bleeding. The cervix is really vascular and it has a slightly unusual blood supply coming partly up from the vaginal arteries and then partly down from the uterine arteries. So it can be really difficult to control bleeding in this area. So ideally you would use methotrexate in this situation. Ovarian, um, so this is an ectopic pregnancy within the ovary itself. Quite often these are diagnosed um, and treated by removal of the affected ovary. Taking the pregnancy separately from the ovary it has been is possible, but it, it's had a huge risk of bleeding because of the blood supply to the ovary. You can consider methotrexate if they're stable, but quite often the diagnosis is unclear and it's something that is identified um, post-surgery. And then heterotopic, this is, these are the tricky ones. So you've got a pregnancy within the womb, um, usually live with a heartbeat, and then a coexisting ectopic pregnancy outside of the womb. So the options depend on what the woman wants. Does she want to continue the intrauterine pregnancy? And then if she does, you've got to treat the ectopic without damaging the intrauterine pregnancy. So you can either do that surgically with removal of the tube. You can inject potassium chloride locally into the sac and then aspirate the sac contents, and that will treat the ectopic whilst leaving the intrauterine pregnancy alone. Um, but again, these are tricky ones and you would perhaps wanting to be get a second specialist opinion as well. So in summary, um, ectopic pregnancy, it can cause morbidity and mortality. It's really important that we manage these cases really carefully. So we should be thinking about our follow up and our decision making and involving exper experienced senior um, people and, and considering second opinions, so second opinion scans and following up. We should consider what's the best clinical option that I can offer and then offer the patient choice. So we always think, are they suitable? Am I offering them a real, um, a sensible option before we do that? And so it should be individualised to each patient. So once you know what the um, options that you can offer are, you should then be thinking about what's the, um, what does the patient want? What's their circumstances and what would be best from their point of view? And always remember that people can rapidly deteriorate, especially young fit women will just suddenly become unwell and we need to react quickly. Um, and always, even with conservative or medical management, there is always that opportunity for rupture that we need to be alert to and we need to react quickly when that happens. So once again, um, feedback forms are really helpful. I've been um, sort of looking at what people are saying, trying to tweak things so that they're helpful for the for everybody. Um, so always really grateful if you can um, fill in the feedback forms.